Hi, we're going to do a teardown of this uh, Trezor hardware Bitcoin wallet. And uh, thanks to the uh, viewer who sent this into the mailbag, they specifically wanted me to do a teardown of this puppy um, to see like how physically secure and everything else it is. So that should be very interesting. Let's take a look. But first of all, what is a hardware wallet? Well, I won't get into what cryptocurrencies are and everything like that. You've no doubt heard of Bitcoin if you're watching this video. Well, well, this is a way to store your Bitcoins or other, uh, it handles Ethereum and Litecoin and uh, various others. It's a hardware wallet physically stored on this little device, which you plug in to your micro uh, USB here. And the advantages of a hardware wallet over like your traditional software wallet or keeping on a USB stick or everything else is that they're encrypted on here. They're physically secure. You can't get hacked by key loggers, malware. You can use them on any computer, anywhere. Uh, you know, nobody can actually recover these unless they have the pin number on the actual device. Uh, to do it. So um, yeah, these are like really offer quite a lot of advantages over a, a software wallet or just store it on your hard drive, a USB stick or one of those online uh, wallets, uh, for example. So even if this hardware wallet gets stolen, they're not going to be able to steal your coins in there because it's, pre it's pin number protected. So unless they coerced you into handing over your pin number and getting them that way, um, they should be physically secure. It can accept up to a nine digit pin and Every time you incorrectly uh, try the pin number, it uh, the the time the wait time period goes up by a factor of two. So it's it's practically impossible to guess the pin number on this thing. But hey, can you extract the pin number from it? Can you you know get something out? Can you physically hardware hack it? Well, that's what we might uh, try and have a little look at in the teardown anyway. And if it does get stolen, you can actually uh, recover them another way using a uh, a recovery. Uh, seed a recovery uh, process. So it's really about the secure pin number in this thing is what people need to physically uh, extract the, your coins from your hardware wallet. So as long as you keep your pin secure, should be you know, pretty physically impossible to actually uh, crack these things. That's the plan anyway. Now this is manufactured by uh, Satoshi Labs. It's a, one of the most, if not the most uh, popular hardware uh, wallet on the market. I believe it was one of the uh, first on the market. And it's had a few security issues in the past, like somebody was able to do a side channel analysis, uh, power analysis attack on this thing and actually recover the private key out of the thing. But uh, yeah, that's been fixed in firmware a couple of years back. Um, so apparently it has not been hacked since. And the other good thing about this is that all the software in here is open source. So you can uh, actually uh, see, go in there, uh, the community can go in there and analyze exactly what's going on inside this thing. And the uh, private keys are kept secure by uh, Satoshi Lab. So as long as they're physically secure, everything should be fine. And this supports our remote firmware upgrade over the uh, USB, but you can't just like flash new firmware in there, hacked firmware or whatever, because the process of doing that act will actually wipe the uh, your coins. Um, so you can do a firmware upgrade, like a proper firmware upgrade without losing your coins, but uh, putting in hacked firmware that's not uh, signed, that doesn't meet the uh, private key at uh, Satoshi Labs, then it's um, it will wipe all your coins in there. So you can't can't hack the thing by just doing some sort of firmware hack or firmware upgrade. So what I'm interested in and what the viewer who sent it in is interested in is actually what's physically inside this thing. Is there any extra hardware uh, security protection and stuff like that? I would like, there's a few things that I would like to see inside this. Uh, like if I was designing a hardware wallet like this, that could be designed to store an unlimited number of Bitcoins. This hardware wallet could store billions of dollars worth of bitcoins it can physically do that so you know people trust these things to uh you know to store their bitcoins we could could be worth a phenomenal amount these days especially if you bought them years ago or something like that when they were worth a pittance and now they're you know a couple of thousand bucks a bitcoin uh, there's significant value tied up inside the hardware security inside these things. So if I was designing this thing just to be sure, there's some like measures that I would uh, take in these. And you see these 
in like uh, pin pads and things like that. We've done teardowns of uh, pin pads before and some other channels have done pin pad uh, teardowns. If you don't know what a pin pad is, one of those uh, FPOST uh, electronic point of sale transaction terminals that you get in shops and banks and things like that um, where you put your credit card in. They have lots of hardware security measures in there. You might uh, pot the products like a hard potting compound in there, I'd be doing that uh, for physical uh, security. And then you'd have uh, anti, you might have some anti uh, tamper stuff inside these things. So if you try and uh, crack the thing open, then you know it might just you know erase the keys if you physically do that. Or you can actually get physically secure main processes. You can buy them where they have like a physical mesh over the top of the die and other physical security measures. So even if you uh, dissolve the chip in like sulfuric acid and uh, try to get like an electron microscope or other device to try and actually read the individual data directly off the die and stuff like that, that can actually physically be prevented with the use of uh, these physically secure chips that you can buy. So I'm just curious if it uses one of those, is it potted, are there any uh, tamper protection if you open the thing? It looks to be ultrasonically uh, you know, heat welded or uh, something like that. So it looks like we're going to have to dremel this thing open. But anyway, let's just take a look at doing a uh, side channel power analysis um, attack because someone actually has done this um, in the past. But uh, I think I mentioned before they have actually uh, fixed that in a firmware update and they may have, um, the hardware may have changed in the couple of years since that uh, hardware side channel attack was uh, revealed. But that's all fixed now apparently. But let's just have a quick squeeze. Okay, so let's just do some basic side channel power line analysis. What I've got is my uh, Roden Schwartz scope here, 10 bit uh, ADC. I've got high res uh, average mode on, 20 meg sample memory depth maximum. And I'm breaking into the uh, ground line of the USB here. I'm just breaking this out into a 10 ohm uh, current sense resistor here. Got that on the scope. Be careful where you put your ground on this. Don't put it on the positive. I've done a whole video on how not to blow up your oscilloscope when probing USB uh, stuff like this. So just be uh, very careful with that if you try and do something like this. And we've got it uh, connected. And the good thing is, is we can get a decent voltage drop across this thing um, and it still works. So this is actually fairly tolerant of, uh, you know, inserting uh, resistors in the power line like this to actually get a, uh, a quite a decent uh, voltage, in this case uh, 100 millivolts uh, per division. So we can uh, see that we're, it, it draws about uh, 40 milliamps or so. So we're actually you know, getting a, quite a decent signal level there. So we've got one second per division triggered at this point over here. And at the same time that I triggered it roughly, I uh, connected to the wallet on the uh, website. So it's, you know, it's basically was sitting there doing nothing and then I connected and sure enough, five seconds later, which matched up with where the information popped up on the screen, took about five seconds to connect and do its business, uh, we see some anomalies here apart from the usual noise. So let me zoom in. So we'll go into the uh, center here where all this regular stuff is. And as you can see, it's very periodic, but we can get some really good detail on there. And that stuff in there is about uh, 5.3 kilohertz. It's very peri... Everything is very periodic. You know, you can like scroll all the way through this and it is identical. So this is your regular processor operations. I can't find any anomalies in there. Um, really, it's just your regular periodic stuff. It's updating the uh, display and doing your regular processor loops. I can't find anything that is out of the ordinary there. So I think they actually have fixed that in the firmware. So the first thing we actually get to is this over here. And we can actually, uh, because this is actually lower, you can see it's a lower current here. We can actually, it's probably like turned off the display or blanking, doing something like that. And uh, a bit, look, there's just not enough time in there for it to, you know, for us to extract any usable data. So I think they've hidden that uh, quite well. I mean, this was a problem. Um, this has been attacked before and then uh, the information was given to Trezor and sure enough, like in the next firmware update, they fixed it. And there might have even been hardware uh, changes since this. This was a couple of years back. So who knows, they might have uh, tweaked the hardware a little bit as well since then. But this uh, brand new one that I've got, there's just not enough information in there based on the previous power line analysis attack um, where they got the uh, private key out of it. it, it, it it's just nuts.
There's not enough room. So I think they've fixed it. It's just, yeah, we can actually measure stuff in there. So it'd be, but it looks like they've hidden it really well. So I can't see us extracting anything from that. And we can actually use an E-field probe as well. I've tried a uh, small H-field probe and I'm not getting any magnetic uh, coupling over that. But if we put this in uh, certain places over the back, we can actually get a, uh, a coupling, uh, not via the ground, but uh, just via the PCB inside there, which haven't taken apart, so I don't know the uh, layout yet. But uh, yeah, we are able to pick something up. Let me show you. Whoa, hang on. Uh, I was just uh, capturing uh, some E-field uh, probe stuff and look, I got some major packets here. I was not connecting via the hardware wallet, um, but I was doing some 200 millisecond per division stuff. And look, we got some uh, much light, like we've really got some periodic uh, stuff in there. And you can see it matches uh, the E-field uh, probe here, which you might have a look at in a minute, but you can actually see some huge variability in there. So is that, but once again, that is very periodic. I don't see um, any information. Was that like updating the display or something like that? But I don't see any actual data in there. And I was not connecting to the wallet at the times. And I've tried some uh, E-field and H-field uh, probe stuff. And with the E-field uh, probe, I've been able to kind of get some correlation on here, but no real extra information on there. So yeah, like there's nothing doing with uh, the EMC analysis at all. So whilst I would like to see, uh, you know, elimination of any possible side channel uh, attack via the power line like this, I mean, you can do that in the uh, hardware. They obviously uh, haven't bothered or they've made some uh, tweaks since, uh, it, since the uh, hack was originally discovered. And it looks like they fixed it, but still, you can see some processor stuff. You can see some periodic interrupts and, uh, you know, stuff like that happening. But I can't see any data. Doesn't mean it's not in there, but yeah, it looks like they've hidden it really well. And what I've got here is it uh, actually starting up from the sleep state. So I click the uh, triggered and click the website over here and then we uh, can see it actually power on. And yeah, we do have some stuff down there, but once again, it's like really not enough information to decode. Um, so there's, yeah, there's nothing doing there at all. One really nice secure feature I love about the Trezor is that when you uh, do a transaction, it pops up with a pin that you have to enter and it's not the same every time. You have to actually have a look down on the device itself to actually see it randomizes that pin location so it's not the same. That is really quite neat. So even if somebody had a key logger on your computer, for example, uh, yeah, they could get where you clicked on that uh, keypad, of course, and they would get, of course, the number of digits, but they don't know because it's a randomized order like this. So they, can, they can't even steal your PIN number with a key logger. Fantastic. And then when you're confirming a transaction, it actually pops up with the actual um, Bitcoin address on the device itself, so you've got to make sure that matches what's on the screen. Terrific security, I love it. They've thought of everything. And we're in. Well, there you go. I'm very surprised just to find the bare PCB. Nothing looks potted at all. Uh, we should be able, um, looks like we need to even get the chip number off that. We'll have a good look at the uh, PCB shortly. And they've got some gunk behind the uh, micro USB connector there. Is that for some extra, just for some extra physical strength? Not entirely sure. Anyway, I'm very surprised that nothing's potted in this thing. Um, that would have been my first port of call if I was designing this, if anything, just, just to make it a bit more physically robust. I mean, this thing, uh, they, they say it's, uh, oh, actually, that could be for water ingress, uh, maybe. Is that hard or is that soft? Yeah, it's a soft, uh, it's a soft compound. So yeah, that, that looks like it's a 
might be a physical uh, water things. I don't think it's waterproof, but it's water resistant or something like that. So, um, yeah, I, but they could have done that better to make it entirely waterproof. But I would have potted the thing. That would have been just as a matter of course, um, physically encapsulated into a, a hard epoxy uh, potting compound over the whole thing, just to make it physically difficult to access. And anyway, let's see if it still works, shall we? It still works. Look at that, right? And I can confirm that that does hook up to my uh, wallet on the computer, like the uh, the web uh, wallet up there. I can see all my information. I can see that it still has my uh, 0.004 bitcoins in there. So it's got like uh, nine, currently $9.89 worth of bitcoins still stuck inside that thing. But that's the thing. I'm, I'm very surprised at that um, for something that's designed to protect your you know, your valuable Bitcoins, which could be worth, you know, potentially millions of dollars. Um, I mean, you wouldn't trust it maybe to one uh, device, but still, right? Um, I would have potted this thing because anyone can just hack that open like I did and get physical access to the pins of the chip. And then you can start hacking away, whether or not it's possible to actually, you know, recover the pin from this thing. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know. It, it will require, you know, a huge amount of effort probably to try and do that. But the first line of defense is physical security and it does not have any. So, and it still works after you open it. So there's no ambient light sensor or micro switch or anything else that any other sort of like anti-physical protection uh, tamper in there that uh, prevents you from accessing chips. But the problem with that, un unlike, say, the uh, pin pads that I mentioned earlier, the FPOST uh, terminals, they will actually have a uh, the keys inside will be battery backed up uh, SRAM, uh, static RAM. So once you get in, and it's actually, they'll have a separate little uh, micro in there that's actually detecting whether or not it's open. And as soon as, say, an ambient light sensor trips or a micro switch, uh, like a contact, physical contact breaks or something like that to know someone's gone in there, then it'll just wipe the memory. Whereas this doesn't have any battery or anything like that. That's why, okay, if it doesn't have, you know, some sort of tamper uh, detection that automatically uh, wipes it or whatever, um, then that's fine, but at least physically prevent the access. You know, I, I would have done that just as a matter of course, really. So what I thought I'd do is uh, just thermally cycle this just to see uh, how it physically survives. And of course, proper thermal cycle, long-term thermal cycle testing is a you know very time-consuming and complicated uh, process. But I'm just going to do it the uh, time-poor engineer's way. Use the electronic freezer spray and the heat gun and just cycle it dit, 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 through. I won't do it to the OLED uh, display because that's not what in, is important because you could actually, uh, the good thing about it not being pot is that you could actually replace the OLED display if that failed. But then of course you'd just buy it, you could buy a new wallet as well and re-seed uh, the thing and, and uh, use your recovery uh, seed that way. But we want to do the chip and um, yeah, just for kicks, why not? Let's go. And I'm doing that at about 100 degrees, so, you know, not, not hot enough to melt the solder. Thermal cycled that a couple of times and I rechecked by connecting to it and my Bitcoins are still there. So, you know, like, we could go to town. I might do it a few more times just for kicks, but I don't expect any issues. It's just a uh, bog standard micro. You could, of course, get the in industrial uh, temperature rated one, of course, just for extra, you know, I would pay extra to get uh, the higher rated, more qualified device, but yeah. All right, let's have a look at this under the Tagano microscope. The first thing you can notice is the shine on there. That's a conformal coating that is to help the uh, water uh, water protection, moisture protection, stuff like that. So they've tried to make it a bit more reliable. You can see where they've mastered off around the uh, uh, tactile switches there. So, you know, that, that's a reasonable moisture protection. So that's a nice little measure. It's not a security uh, measure at all. It's just purely for uh, water ingress. And it's basically just one arm chip 
on a board with a USB. That's um, that's basically it. This would be the JTAG interface. We could uh, follow the uh, traces down to there, but it's one. Uh, there won't be anything under the LCD there. That physically, the LCD is phys uh, Sorry, the OLED uh, display there is physically uh, down on the board. So there's nothing else. There's just the one arm chip. So it's basically just a software. Uh, solution, which is fine, which is you know basically all that's uh, all that's required, and we can actually get in there, and it looks like is that an ST part 32F 205RET6. Let's go to the data sheet, but I'm pretty sure this is not a physically secure processor. So that's a bit. It's just a regular Joe Blogs um, processor. Um, I'm a little bit disappointed in that. Peel off our gunk there. There we go. Got access to our our pins. And of course those test pads on the bottom there for uh, production bed of nails uh, testing. So um, yeah, we could like... It, this thing is e easily probable. Um, but it's all a matter of the uh, the software security side as i said so that's where all the uh magic happens so i didn't guess it doesn't need to be any fancier than this but i i just maybe would have used just a secure processor as a matter of course because if you get in there and dissolve all away all the um uh, the epoxy uh case with a, a sulfuric acid then you can get access to the dye and technically if you didn't damage it during that process which is possible you could get in there with an electron microscope or other means and physically see uh and physically extract the um presumably the pin number out of it but yeah, that'd be you know real advanced uh, pretty advanced skills but maybe it's possible but the interesting thing about this is even if you could uh, dissolve the chip in sulfuric acid, get access in there, recover the pin, the security, you could reflash the uh, programming uh, fuse in there, load some firmware on, which, you know, some hacked firmware, which could extract it or whatnot, you know, spoof it into extracting the uh, pin code out of the thing and getting it working that way. Um, all that takes significant time, whereas if you, uh, uh, once you realise your... Uh, Trezor hardware wallet has been stolen, you can simply change the recovery seed uh, key for the thing, which would effectively uh, should uh, present and prevent them actually uh, doing that. You know, it basically renders the thing physically useless once you've uh, changed that recovery seed. So, um, yeah, I, you know, it's it's probably adequate. I guess my main concerns are like adequate from a hacker security uh, point of view. My main concerns would be um, just just the physical reliability of the wallet. I would have, okay, they've done some uh, conformal coding in here, which is okay to prevent moisture ingress and uh, stuff like that. Is there a, there's a, you know, a little bit there which is exposed and moisture can get in under the chip and like whatnot. Um, I, I just physically would have potted the whole thing. Like that's not a huge extra cost. I would have, would have done that as a matter of course, really. And there's not a huge amount of uh, capacitance or diode uh, protection in here to prevent that power line attack. But as we saw, you know, uh, there's not real... There doesn't seem to be anything to see there because they've spoofed that, fixed it in uh, f uh, software, which is, you know, in entirely possible. So the fact that, you know, stuff does get back out, uh, like, you know, you can see the processor cycles, the interrupt cycles inside this thing and other stuff um, is leaking back out through the power line. Um, it's not a big deal as long as you know about that fact and you can compensate for that in software so you can this software is open source so you can go see the changes they made since this was originally uh had that power line hack and you can see what uh you know anti-spoofing uh stuff they've done there it's all it, it'll all be documented in this uh source code surely so there you have it. That's the Trezor hardware wallet from Satoshi Labs and it's just a microcontroller with lots of software magic and that's all there is to it. There's no extra hardware uh, security, which I'm a little bit surprised at, but 
it, it, you know, it, it's not a real issue because it's all about the software security. They really have thought about this thing. And apart from the power line uh, attack, which they have fixed, that I don't believe, please correct me in the comments down below if you know of another uh, successful hack attempt on uh, these things um, uh, to get the uh, pin and recover the bitcoins out of it, uh, either hardware or uh, software, please let us know. Yes, we could hook up the uh, programmer on there to get in there, but we're not. They've thought about this okay there right it's all about uh the firmware in there is signed via the secret key at uh, so the private key at uh, satoshi labs and if you try and do anything to the firmware it's just going to erase those keys so you know there's pretty much going to be no attack uh i'm not going to say it's impossible but i haven't heard of anyone doing it and i'm not going to try and do it because that's not my expertise uh like you know uh, software hacking and ST um, uh, micro, for example, or any sort of uh, cryptographic uh, hacking and stuff like that. I'll leave it up to those more experienced, and I'm sure a lot of people have uh, tried, and there's only been the one successful power line attempt as far as I know, so it seems pretty solid. Although it just occurred to me, what if you actually hooked up the uh, ST ARM programmer to the programming port on this thing? I've got one here, it costs like, you know, tens of dollars, they're dirt cheap, and what if you could actually uh, get in there and modify the E Square Prom content uh, where it actually stores that uh, uh, pin enable thing? So if you get like the pin incorrect, for example, it will store it in the E Square Prom that you got it wrong, and then the next time you power it up, you could uh, like it reads that, and then it uh, determines right you got to wait a longer period, and then a, a exponentially longer period as you do more attempts. But if you could somehow automate the power cycle process and also uh, reset, find and reset that E squared prom contents where it actually stores that, maybe you could have an infinite, well, a very fast process for um, actually systematically attacking the pin and running through all the pin number contents. Although maybe, you, you know, you can only write to an E squared prom so many times so it might die before you get to the uh, pin number, especially if it's nine digits long, for example. But you never know. I, you know, I thought that maybe there might be something there. But yeah, I'd have to set up this and find that where it's actually stored in there and actually try it. And it's a lot of effort, maybe for a second video or maybe someone else out there can uh, give it a try or maybe they already have and it's not an issue. Anyway, that just came to mind. But I think, like, this thing should have a version or, you know, maybe you can pay more for a, you know, a premium version that is just like, instead of having the plastic case on the thing, actually encase the entire thing in epoxy cotton potting compound and it becomes the case. It becomes one big solid monolithic block with just the cutout window for the LCD and the uh, switches. The switches could even be done uh, capacitively uh, coupled or uh, something like that, perhaps. Um, but yeah, I would, you know, I'd like to see a more physically robust device than this. If I was, you know, trusting huge um, sums of bitcoins uh, on this thing, then you know, I'd, I'd want some. I'd love, like to pay for a more premium, uh, physically robust device. I, but the security, I think. You know, they're probably as good as you're going to get software-wise. So I hope you enjoyed that video and found it interesting and useful. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. Catch you next time.